We're on the Strand in London for episode four of season two of Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with History Today, the world's leading serious history magazine. I'm Peter Moore. Welcome to Travels Through Time. Today we're going back to one of the most notorious years of all, 1483, to look at an act of ruthlessness almost unmatched in all English history. The rise and fall of the House of York remains one of the most compelling and controversial stories in all of English history. It's the central thread of the violent episodes that we remember today as the Wars of the Roses. They were really a desperate struggle in the late 15th century between the houses of Lancaster and York, a struggle for Edward the Confessor's ancient crown of solid, jewel-encrusted gold. These were years of battles, betrayals and beheadings, when, as Thomas Penn puts it in his astonishing new book on the subject, Necessity Knew No Law. Today we're going to be talking about the blackest year of them all, 1483, the year the House of York started to consume itself. Today's guest, Thomas Penn, holds a PhD in medieval history from Clare College in Cambridge. His best-selling biography of Henry VII, the first Tudor king, that was called the Winter King, won the H.W. Fisher Prize. Now he's back with a prequel of sorts. The Brothers York tells the story of the House of York between 1461 and 1485. I met up with Tom the other day in central London. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to Travel Street Time, Tom. Thank you very, very much, Peter. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a wonderful book. Let's get into the history. I said that this story really focuses on the year between 1461 and 1485, which really is a period between the two great battles of Towton and Bosworth. How can we characterise this quarter of a century? It's a very good question, and it's a question that historians have been wrestling with pretty much ever since Bosworth was fought. In the public imagination, we see this period that of a great struggle between two houses, as you say, between the houses of York, the White Rose, and the House of Lancaster the Red Rose. We still, to some extent, drink the Tudor Kool-Aid. We believe that the Tudors, in winning the Battle of Bosworth, Henry Tudor, Henry VII as he became, united these two warring houses in one, in a new dynasty, the Tudors. And to symbolise that, Henry VII came up with a new device, the Tudor Rose, which combined these two roses into the rose, both red and white. And this story, I think, still remains the most enduring myth of all. We have ceased to believe in much so-called Tudor propaganda about the period, but we still do believe that, to some extent, that the Tudors united these two houses. But what I would contend, really, is that it wasn't so much a case of Henry Tudor winning Bosworth as the Yorkist family imploding, destroying itself. I think I just want to talk very briefly about Edward IV, because even though he doesn't appear um, centrally in the scenes we're going to talk about today, he's a great force in the period. Probably the easiest way to describe him, um, and this is maybe a caricature, but there's a lot of truth in it, I think, is that he's almost Henry VIII before Henry VIII. Everything that we think about as what Henry VIII was as a king, very powerful, charismatic, good-looking, a big drinker, loved the women, loved the joust. All these things were Edward IV before they were Henry VIII. Is that right? Do you know, I think it is. And perhaps that's unsurprising because, of course, Edward IV was Henry VIII's maternal grandfather. People who look at Henry VIII now would certainly recognise Edward IV in him because he had many of the same physical attributes. He was six foot four inches in his stocking feet. He was a magnetic, virile, charismatic war leader. He was a boy who had seized the throne at the age of 18 in 1461, having already won his great defining battles of Mortimer's Cross and Towton. And he has absolutely a magnetic personality, but he resembles Henry VIII in another way too, in that he has a compulsive nature. And perhaps even more than Henry VIII, he's, he's the consummate narcissist. There's a much darker side to Edward IV. 
And perhaps it's a sighting that we haven't fully understood. His compulsion, his narcissism, fuels everything that he does. He's a great administrator, a great governor. You can see his signature all over the documents of the period. He's a great war leader, as we've said, but he's also a great guzzler and stuffer. He doesn't know when to stop at table. It horrifies his doctors and his counsellors. He's a great womanizer. He's a complete sexual narcissist. Mm. And of course, as he gets older, he becomes like Henry, the old Henry VIII as well, because he can't stop. And you see it in these two pictures of the period. One, this great fine king, the most beautiful prince my eyes ever beheld, says the French chronicler Philippe de Comines. And one at the end of the period where he's, he's got multiple chins, and he clearly, you know, has become this great bloated figure. And people at the time, chroniclers at the time use the same, they, they use this word, they say he's gross. Mm. So when he dies in 1483, aged 40, a premature death really, people couldn't work out what had happened to him at the time. Maybe he had a stroke, perhaps it was a result of the malaria that he may have picked up when campaigning in France in 1475. Perhaps it was simply that he ate and drank himself to death. Mm. Who knows? Yeah, you're right that he was the son in whom warmth the subjects basked and around which even his greatest lords revolved. It's a really important picture and I think this just sets the scene for us in 1483 which we're going to talk about now yes. because if you take the sun out of the universe then there's a great problem of arrangement isn't there? There's a great vacuum that needs to be filled and so Let's get on to 1483 straight away. Uh, things that we need to, to cover, this is the decline of Edward IV. He's an old, ill, well, not old in years, but in his physical sense, in spirit maybe, he seems old. And he dies around Easter of that year. He does. And his decline is very rapid. People know that Edward IV is not in good physical shape. He's supposed to have led an army to Scotland. Twice, in fact. The first time he completely gives up. He arrives at Oxford and starts drinking and keeps drinking as far as we can make out. And he never actually makes it north. He sends Richard, his youngest brother, Richard, Richard Duke of Gloucester, in his place. Then the second time he makes it as far as, as far as Fotheringay, the great family home of Fotheringay in Lincolnshire. And again, he gives up in 1482 and he says, OK, to Richard, you, can, you, you lead the army, you can be the war leader. It's almost a, a handing over, if you like, of the, the mantle of war leader. And so Richard goes to Scotland, spends loads of money trying to seize the Scottish government, if you like. It doesn't work out and he comes back. And in 1483, there's a political hammer blow for Edward because for the, la the last few years, he's been trying to arrange the map of Northern Europe, really, in favour of, favour of his family by the time-honoured expedient of marrying his kids off into the families of Burgundy and France. And essentially what happens... In early 1483, they come to an arrangement without him and they lock him out. And for him, it's an absolute disaster. He's mm -hmm. furious. Some commentators thought at the time that it was this that helped precipitate this decline. And he is, along with the gluttony and the, the guzzling and all the rest of it, he is becoming depressed as well. It's not just a question of him being gross, but it's, it's being depressed. But as you say, he has been this great king. He has been the great centripetal force for English politics. He's been the king that's held everything together. He is a, still a magnificent king. Yeah. And so when he dies, it catches everybody on the hop. So you rightly point out the difficulties that people were spotting. Okay, he's in poor health. And there's these problems with regards to his foreign policy in particular. But in other senses, there's quite a lot of reason for optimism, isn't it? Because you talk about the Christmas before 1482, there's a great display of the family yeah. unity. And especially there's like a, there's a clear succession because he's got a 12 year old son, Edward, um, who seems very capable. He's Indeed. being primed, he's being readied for his role as the next monarch. And then there's an heir and there's a spare, if you like, because then Indeed. there's Richard, his younger brother. So that's fine. But I suppose the other thing you alluded to as well in your last description is maybe the people with keener eyes, you know, something they might have spotted. There's a very, very powerful brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who you describe in the book as being one of the most powerful noblemen since the Norman conquest. His, so Edward has heaped all of this power on him in terms of Absolutely. land and power, yeah. and he's reigning with a lot of authority in the north. That's right. So that's the dynamic. That is the dynamic. And you're right, there is a lot of cause for optimism. And Edward, the boy Edward, Edward V, we mustn't confuse our Edwards, yeah. is the oldest son of Edward's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville, mm. is absolutely being primed to take the throne. Of that, there is no doubt. 
I suppose that the problem is that when a great king dies, whatever the situation with the succession, it leaves a vacuum. It does throughout all history. We see this repeated time and again. Even when there's a successor who's ready to step into his shoes, there's a readjustment. All the pieces are thrown up in the air. But with Edward V, the problem is that he's a minor. He's 12. So in, in, in a way, it's the he's worst... He's just a little bit too young. He's just it? a little bit too young. And it's the worst situation of all, in a way, because when Henry VI comes to the throne in his infancy, when on Henry V's death in 1422, that's kind of easy because he's an infant, so people know what to do. They put in place a mechanism for government and they carry on. But the situation is not so clear-cut. For the, for the ruling council who gather, a kind of emergency council who gather after Edward IV's death, they said, well, what are we going to do? Will he be crowned? Will he start to rule immediately? Or does he need a bit of a helping hand, in fact, because he is still a boy. He can't really rule himself. To reign is not necessarily to rule. He's going to need mechanisms in place. And, of course, one of those tried and tested mechanisms is, is that of protector. I'm going to leave you there because I think we're perfectly primed for our scenes. As you say, just a bit of chronology here. So it's the early hours of Wednesday, the 9th of April, Edward dies. He was a few weeks short of his 41st birthday. So, you know, it's quite young, I suppose. You've picked Northampton, the night of April the 29th, 30th. Richard and Buckingham are there. What's going on? Can you describe the scene? Let's do the descriptive history before we do the analytical history. So where's Northampton for our American listeners, I should say? So Northampton, it's one of the towns seen to be in the centre of the kingdom. It's a town which I guess is 100 or so miles north of London. It's on the Great North Road. It's on the road that heads north. And this is a road that's extremely well travelled because the north is perennially a problem for English kings. And so they all lead their armies up and down the Great North Road. But it's a useful meeting place because it's a communications hub. It's lots of other roads go through it as well. And what's happened is I was talking earlier about the council that gathers after Edward the Fourth's death. And one of the things they want to do is to preserve unity. When the king that holds it all together dies, then factions begin to emerge. Things begin to sort of buckle and splinter. And it's quite difficult to keep that unity together. And one of these fault lines is between the Queen's family, the family of Elizabeth Woodville, Edward the Fourth's widow now, who basically rule the new young king. Elizabeth Woodville's brother, Anthony Woodville, is the governor of the new young king. He's responsible for his education, his upbringing. And in this king's council are Woodvilles, basically, and their hangers-on after the death of Edward IV. Many people are caught in the hop. People aren't all in London. You have Richard, Duke of Gloucester, in the north, in his Yorkshire seat of Midlam. You have another great lord of royal blood, Henry Duke of Buckingham, who's away in Wales. And you have the young king and his maternal uncle, Anthony Woodville, in Ludlow, in the Welsh marches. And one of the things that the council are trying to do is balance out these conflicting interests. So they say, why don't you all come to London together? Let's have a level playing field. You'll all bring a respectable, but not excessive number of armed retainers. So what happens is it's agreed, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and the young king and his entourage, commanded by Anthony Woodville, will meet in Northampton, and together they'll go to London, and they'll arrive in May Day, which of course is the great day of renewal and rebirth, and what perfect symbolism for this new young king to inherit the crown of England and to enter his capital. So what happens in Northampton that makes you want to go back to this particular moment? So what happens in Northampton is on that night, the 29th, 30th of April, there's a dinner, and the king and his entourage are built in south of Northampton in Stony Stratford, a town and communications hub on the Great North Road, a bit further towards London. They ride over to Northampton and they have dinner with Richard and the Duke of Buckingham, who's just arrived. And it's very convivial, it's very merry, everybody's very happy with the arrangements for the new government under Edward V. And then most of them go to bed, but Richard and Buckingham don't. Richard and Buckingham stay up. And Buckingham's a very important noble. Buckingham's With a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He's got a great chip on his shoulder. As I, as I mentioned, he's, he's a nobleman of, of Lancastrian royal blood. His grandfather's killed in battle in 1460. His father's died before that. So he basically becomes a ward of the Yorkist court. He's brought up as a Yorkist. He's married into the Queen's family. And he has a lot of prestige. All the prestige that should accrue to, to him as a, as a great nobleman of the royal blood. But he has none of the power. Mm. And basically Edward IV doesn't like him very much. He becomes this great glittering courtly bauble, but he's locked out of power completely. So he's, he's an incredibly frustrated guy. And when Edward IV dies, 
he sees an opportunity. I think you mentioned as well earlier in the book that he's a kind of childhood friend of Richard's, isn't he? he? Is. They well, spent time when they were younger together. They spent they spent a long time. So th- in a yeah. sense you've got these two people with maybe well, one who's very powerful, one who's seeking a bit more power, with an old acquaintance sitting up having a chat. Sitting up having a chat, but they have been in touch beforehand. Okay. This is the other thing. So when Buckingham away in Wales, his news of Edward IV's death, he sends a messenger across the country to Richard saying, in this new world, I'm at your service and I'm placing my men at your service as well. Mm-hmm. Now, what this service is, who knows? The thing that they discuss, clearly, is seizing power. As we've said, Richard, youngest brother of Edward IV, uncle to the new young king, has been a model of loyalty. He's been impeccable. He's fought for Edward during the, bat- the, the, the earlier battles in, in the civil wars. He is Edward's right-hand man. Mm. He's led Edward's army to Scotland. There's nothing to suggest that he will do anything other than be loyal to Edward V. In fact, he's pledged his loyalty to the council, to Queen Elizabeth, just recently. So why, why does he want to seize power? And why does Bucky want to help him? He knows that as the great nobleman of the blood, he should have power. All precedent suggests that he should be the man to head up the government. If there is going to be a protector, if there's going to be a chief councillor, it should be him. And apparently Edward IV, in his will, which we don't have, which has not survived, Edward IV has promised Richard that he will have the protectorship. Or it's something it's like an incredibly it. vivid scene. I, I mean, obviously, it's so powerfully charged with narrative tension because you've got this coming together of two very, very dynamic, powerful people, really. Vivid to the eye as well because Richard, we kind of have the Shakespearean picture of him you know, rightly or wrongly, does spring to mind. Staying up late after a merry evening in 1483, discussing what essentially is the coup, which I think happens the next day, is that right? That's absolutely right. One of the things that is concerning Richard is how the new government is going to be arranged. Now, the people around Edward V, this boy, as prince, are his maternal relatives. And if that model around him is transferred, lock, stock and barrel, onto the household of the new young king, then then clearly those relatives are going to dominate him. They're going to dominate his relationships with the rest of the the political elite. They're going to dominate the way that he hands out favour. That's something that clearly Richard has come to fear. And one of the people we haven't yet mentioned is a man called William Lord Hastings. Now, William Lord Hastings is... Edward IV's Chamberlain. He's a man who's extremely close to court. He's the most influential and powerful figure around the late king. And he represents that body of opinion, those household men around Edward who have fought for him, who have protected him, who have done his bidding, who owe everything. They owe all their wealth and power to him. And Hastings is the supreme example of that. Now, Hastings does not get on with the Woodbills historically. And there's not much in the record to show this, but there's enough for us to know that whenever the fourth dies, he's very opposed to the Woodbills having the custody of Edward V. Very opposed. He's, he's vocally opposed. He says, if this happens, I'm going to take my men and I'm going to go off to Calais. Calais is, is an extraordinary place because it's it's England's only foothold on the northern European coast. It's a very financially powerful place, but it's also very militarily powerful. It has a standing garrison. And saying you're going to go to Calais is a threat. Hastings is the man at court. Richard, when Edward IV dies, as we've said, he's hundreds of miles north. So he's relying for information on what's happening. And clearly, one of the things that's happening is that Hastings is sending messages and communication north saying, this is what the Woodbills are planning to do. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Richard and Buckingham. It's also the information provided by Hastings. And Hastings isn't there. He's not in that inn in Northampton on the 29th. But his influence is. But his influence is. And this is very clearly the faction which has developed this. On one side, yeah. you have these three characters yeah. of different personalities and profiles. Yeah. On the other, you have the maternal family of the young, uncrowned King Edward, the Woodvilles. And I suppose what makes it all the more tantalising is they're so close to London. All they've got to do is get him down another 60 miles or so. Right. And then they can set up shop, go on with the coronation as soon as the coronation's been carried out. Well, Absolutely. there you go. Absolutely That's the job right. done. Absolutely right. And so this is last chance saloon in a way for Richard. If they want to act, this is the moment. It's the only way. And one of the, thing, one of the interesting things about Richard's thinking as well is that this is a great, he's very afraid. But this is also the great moment of opportunity, as you say. And a lot of the political atmosphere, the political mentality of the last 30 years has been about this, these twin impulses of fear, of trying to protect yourself in a situation of extreme political uncertainty, and opportunism. 
if all the cards are up in the air, maybe how can I arrange them when they fall to suit myself? As mm. well as the country, of course. You know, Richard wants what's best for the country. Let's not yeah. forget that. No, you, you describe that perfectly. I just wanted to to touch on something you write about in the book. It's a sentence which clarifies a situation perfectly. And you say that possession of the king is nine-tenths of the right. law. And this is something we know from what happened with Henry VI before. He was always passed between... Absolutely. And so this is like the trump card and whoever Absolutely. holds it. So Absolutely. that's what happens, isn't it? The next it, day, it they storm in and say, well, hang on, we're here to protect you from they your do. malevolent... In laws. Well. Indeed. And and just to go back to what you were saying about the physical geography, Stony Stratford is 15 miles south of Northampton, just on this past road, the Great North Road to London. It's one of the reasons why Anthony Woodville, the Boy King's governor, has chosen Stony Stratford. It's very close to the Woodville estates at Grafton Regis. But it also gives them a head start. But the problem is he's walked into this trap in Northampton. He's ridden over and to Northampton, 15 miles north, to have dinner with Richard. And it's Richard's job that fateful night, not only to confirm with Buckingham what they're going to do, but how they're going to do it. And this is where Hastings comes in again, because Hastings, the man who's not there, he may not be there, but his men are. And one of the things about Hastings, he's the man at court. He's the man who knows everything about how the chamber and household work. But he's also one of the most influential players in Northamptonshire. Mm. His chief lawyer, a man called William Catesby, his second in command in Northamptonshire. Catesby is a local man. He's a local big man. His son-in-law is the sheriff of Northamptonshire, the man responsible for local law enforcement, a man called Roger Wake. Hastings and Catesby have this situation sewn up and it's their men whose local intelligence allows Richard to seal off Northampton, to make sure that nobody can get out of Northampton, to make sure that no information can get to Stony Stratford and tip the boy king off to tell him to hightail it to London before Uncle Richard gets there. And so the following day, Richard and Buckingham turn up to Stony Stratford. They tell the boy king, your maternal relatives, your Woodfields, are no good. They're no good for you, they're no good for the kingdom. And we, Richard and Buckingham, are going to take charge. It's a dramatic set piece scene. In a way, it brings together so many of the elements that we think of. You can't really improve on that. I think this is generally the thing. Let's go to your second scene, which picks up the story in about a month's time. It's Friday the 13th of June. We're actually in the Tower of London, so yeah, that doesn't need too much description from me. I'm sure people can imagine what happens on the 13th of June, what 1483, in the Tower of London. What happens on Friday the 13th of June is a council meeting. It's a select group of the council, actually. It's not the whole council. It's a select group of handpicked people who Richard has ordered to come and meet him. The rest of the council is meeting in Westminster, downriver, discussing the preparations for the young king's coronation. But as I say, this is a comparatively small gathering, and it consists of people like... William Lord Hastings, who we've already talked about, a man called John Morton, who is one of the great government officials of Edward IV's reign. Um, William Lord Stanley, he's another extremely influential household official under Edward IV, and he's a very influential figure in the northwest of England, and various others. And they meet around nine o'clock in the morning, they walk into the council chamber, and Richard's very pleasant. He greets Morton, says, my lord, I, I hear you have fine strawberries in your garden at Hoban. He says, I pray you uh, let me have a mess of them. These are these are Thomas More's words trans, transposed. So this is yeah. kind of 15th century small talk. This is 15th century small talk. Everybody's milling around. And then they sit down. And there are a lot of places around the council table and business begins. And Richard's demeanour changes. And suddenly he starts getting very serious. And he, he's a great gnaw of his bottom lip, apparently. He chews on his bottom lip as a kind of sign of stress. And he says to the assembled councillors, he says there's something been going on. Those Woodvilles who are now in prison, the Queen is in sanctuary in Westminster, and their followers are trying to destroy me by witchcraft. And he says, I'm going to show you what's happening. My body is falling away. My body's failing me. And of course, we now know, with the sensational discovery of Richard's skeleton, we now know that he did have scoliosis. And one of the effects of scoliosis was to make one shoulder higher than the other. So Richard puts his hands on the council table, and one of those arms is shorter than the other because of this physiological, this out-of-kilter physiology produced by the scoliosis and he says this is this is a result of sorcery and then he rounds on Hastings and he says the queen's guilty of treason what would you do if the queen was found guilty of treason she she must be guilty the Woodfields must be guilty and Hastings says well if she's found guilty my lord then of course she should receive the appropriate punishment and Richard asks the question again he says but what what if she's guilty and Hastings says well you know if she's found guilty then clearly she must be punished and Richard says but you're guilty as well 
And this is an incredible moment because William Lord Hastings is the establishment man. He's the man who's smoothed Richard's path to power, whose presence in Richard's coup has dissipated any concerns about the move that people might have had because they look at Hastings and they think, well, you're loyal to the princes, you're loyal to the memory of Edward IV, therefore everything must be all right. And now Richard's accusing Hastings of treason. It's an astonishing confrontation, absolutely astonishing. I mean, you write that a month, well, this is after they arrive in London in May, Hastings is bursting with joy. He's he the is. happiest man in town. He is. This, like, he looked like he was going to be, you know, subservient to these Woodvilles again, which was going to be bad news for him. All of a sudden, his friendly lord from the north is in control of everything. So it's cinematic almost, this moment. It is cinematic. It's the pointing of the finger almost feels a bit cliched, but it happened, didn't it? It, it did happen. And it, it, it happens, we know that it happens because a number of different chroniclers from different backgrounds write about it. I mean, this isn't, this isn't yeah. you know, your Tudor propaganda. This happened. Yeah. And as you say, the irony is extreme. There's Hastings after the first coup, swatting about London, saying this transference of power to Richard was achieved without so much blood spilt from the, from a cut finger. So he's saying this has been so smooth, and then suddenly, here we are. And Hastings is given no time to defend himself. Now, when people are accused of treason, generally there's there's a process. It's a pretty uneven process, but there is a special court for treason trials. Now Hastings isn't even given that privilege. Mm. Richard's men burst into the council chamber. They set about them. Lord Stanley apparently ducks under a table and is cut in the head by a flailing sword. Hastings himself is seized. He's dragged out of the council chamber, dragged out of the White Tower onto the adjacent Tower Green. A priest from the nearby chapel of St Peter Advincular is summoned out to shrive him to give him the last rites and he's put on the block and he's beheaded. Like that. This was an age of ruthlessness, wasn't it? I mean, reading through, I mean, if I was to make a tally of the beheadings as I was going through your book, I think we'd be well in, well, in, you know, in the teens, in the 20s, maybe 100, I don't know. But in, in particular, there's something particularly brutal about this. You say the lack of due process, the status of the person, there's the setting in the tower. But also, it seems to me that, OK, what happened at the start of May or the end of April, sorry, was really disturbing. The uncrowned king has been taken possession of by Richard. But this just escalates things to a high level. And something you said then I just want to pick up on is that you said to be accused of treason. Isn't treason plotting against the king's person? Isn't the implication in this that Richard is considering himself as king? Absolutely. It's worth saying that there's been a degree of slippage between Richard's seizure of power at Stony Stratford and this scene in the tower. Richard has been a traditional kind of protector. He's been the chief counsellor, if you like, the kind of chief executive. But he is bound by the council, but all the time he's trying to push the envelope. And one of the reasons why people like Hastings and Morton are concerned is that they believe that Richard is trying to arrange the government so that he will actually be king himself, and that he never actually wants this coronation to happen. And this is where Hastings and other Yorkists, and it sh this is the thing that should be stressed, they are Yorkists faithful to the House of York, to Edward IV, to the princes, to the Yorkist succession, they begin to get concerned. They begin to think that, actually, we didn't want this. The thing that we approved, the protectorate that we approved, Richard's seizure of power that we approved, we only approved it as a protectorate. We didn't mean that the line of succession should change. Mm -hmm. They are Yorkist loyalists. They want Edward V to succeed. But it's quite clear at this point that Richard, for one reason or another, has no intention of letting that happen. Well, let's leave that there, because I don't think we can improve on your description there. You have this confrontation followed by a summary execution in the yard. And I suppose people just start to look at things quite differently now. Hang on, well, the Edward V is, is perhaps being cared for in the tower one moment, but then if you start to look at it now, it seems like maybe perhaps he's prisoner. And we know that a lot of the Woodville's dispersed or they've gone into sanctuary in Westminster, so the king's mother is in there with the younger brother. We know that Richard then tempts the younger brother to join his elder brother in the tower. So you have two princes in the tower, which might be a familiar phrase Indeed. to some people. Indeed so. And there's a sense of slippage again with their situation because they're seen one moment playing in the palace grounds, firing bows and arrows, whatever, you know, just being kids. And then they're suddenly seen through windows. That's right. Then they're not seen at all. That's right. Then the narrative is changing still. And at this point, with more enemies eliminated, 
Richard just starts to style himself as king. He has this coronation of his own planned. You know, it's a kind of boiling the frog thing when people don't really see. But on the street, it must have been quite a story. And, you know, Hastings' execution, it polarises the situation in another way too. The Queen's family, or the Woodbills as they become, they are seen as political pariahs. And that's fine. People think, OK, we, we can deal with that. But the execution of Hastings, a man oppo himself opposed to the Woodbills, brings into play another kind of dynamic because suddenly people are starting to make a different kind of choice. People, All people loyal to Edward IV, we have to stress that again, and to the Yorkist succession, are thinking, who do I support? Do I support the boys in the tower, missing, presumed dead, or do I support Richard III as he becomes? So, so this starts to become very much a conflict between two factions of one family. And with Hastings' execution, this is made very, very clear. I think you've set that up perfectly. And this is the sentiments which, you know, are probably being played out within council chambers, but, you know, also a common person on the streets is having, because they've seen the processions. One minute you have one person, another you have another. And you describe, I suppose, in the book, this sense over the late summer of Richard losing control of the narrative, which yeah. might sound a bit Fox Newsy, actually, if we <laughs> if we talk about it in that sense. But that's really what's happening, isn't it? There's there's whispers, aren't there? There are whispers. And as you say, the whispers are because around the time of the coronation, of Richard's coronation, the princes disappear. They disappear from view completely. And people are very concerned. People loyal to the princes are very concerned. And in early July, Richard goes on progress to, to show himself to his new kingdom. He's, he's a king who believes himself to be an ideal king. He's read a lot about kingship in books. He knows what kingship means. He thinks that he can be the ideal king. He's going to be the great peace giver, the great law giver, the great warrior, the strong man who can protect England from its foes. And he's going on progress, as, as new kings always do. And once he's out of town, something happens. Well, let's go from that then to the third scene. I think we're all poised. The political landscape has been sketched really, really well. You mentioned the geography of it there as well, because geography was always really important in the 15th century, where who was where at a particular moment. Absolutely. Um, where, shall we say, where's Richard on Sunday the 12th of October 1483? And what does he hear about on that day? Richard is at Lincoln. And he, so he's been on his progress. He's been on this his is, progress. He's gone pleasure. north in his ducal heartlands. He's the great lord of the north, of course. At York, he has what is in effect a second coronation. He's coming back down south now to London, and he stops off in stages, and he gets to Lincoln. But he's already heard that his great ally, the Duke of Buckingham, the man who has facilitated his seizure of power, with whom he's formed a kind of duumvirate in a way, is on the move against him. He's rebelling against him. He's leading an army out of Wales against him, the man who he has put on the throne. And now, months later, he's seeking to depose Richard. So I spoke before about this. there's something particularly nasty about the beheading of Hastings. There's something even more peculiar in the context of rebellions of this time or... Um, what should we say, betrayals. This is a particularly bad betrayal, isn't it? I mean, this alliance between them is only really a few months old. It is. And then, all of a sudden, um, here comes another army. That's yeah. it, and Richard's given Buckingham everything. Yeah. He writes this extraordinary note, actually. One of the things he does at Lincoln is to write back to London to ask for the Great Seal. Now, the Great Seal is the supreme expression of royal authority, and what it enables the king to do is to raise troops, because when people see this great wax mould of the seal, they know that it means the king word and he writes back to London now this is done by a clerk you in in the period you have these warrants which are which are copied out by the King's Secretariat but Richard adds a note of his own and he's got this crabby crabby hand quite a neat hand and he scribbles and it's covered with smudges and ink blots and he writes below the clerk's message and then he turns it 90 degrees because he's run out of space and he scribbles again in the margin and he asks the Chancellor John Russell for the Great Seal and then he talks about Buckingham and he kind of slides into this incredulous rage he says Buckingham is the most untrue creature living. I have given him everything. Why is he being unfaithful to me, the king? Now, one of the things that's happened in the intervening period is that Buckingham and Richard have had a bit of a spat. And of course, Buckingham and Richard come to power together. As I've said before, they are something of a duumbra. But of course, Richard's now king. And Buckingham is his greatest subject. But he is his subject. And Buckingham's asking for more, more, more. He's asking so, for the return so of more the... ancestral lands. And Richard slaps him down. So is the answer to the obvious question, why greed. So Buckingham has, you know, maybe over the summer he's enjoying the splendours, the power, and he's just being carried away, transported by his imagination that he can have so much more. It's partly that. 
And it's partly something else as well. What happens over the summer is that this concern about the disappeared princes, which of course is a concern among those Yorkists loyal to the memory of Edward IV and the princes, it develops into a full-blown conspiracy. And it involves not just servants of the late king, but it involves Henry Tudor, who is an exile, a fugitive exile, Lancastrian exile in Brittany, where he's been for the previous 12 years. And it involves Buckingham. And one of the people who persuades Buckingham to turn against the man that he's put on the throne is this figure of John Morton. He's an extraordinary figure. He's a Lancastrian turned Yorkist. And of course, he becomes the great eminence grise of Henry VII, the first Tudor king. He is the kind of architect of Tudor power, if you like, but he's very much as well. First and foremost, he's a servant of the late King Edward IV. And he's a prisoner of Buckingham. And this is the extraordinary scene. He's held prisoner in Buckingham's castle of Brecon. And he works Buckingham. He's an extremely experienced political player, John Morton. He's extremely persuasive. He persuades Buckingham that he's owed more than Richard's given him. He's a great nobleman of the blood. Richard hasn't done well by you. What has Richard done, he says to Buckingham? Richard sees power. He's a usurper. The people are against Richard. Do you think it's wise for you still to be aligned with Richard? There's an opportunity for you here. Why don't you seize it? And the thing is that he makes Buckingham think that this is all his own idea. So Buckingham, I mean, he's had this horse whispering in Brecon from Morton. Richard hears about it on the 12th. One of the reasons, I suppose I'll put this question to you, one of the reasons why you might want to see Richard on that day at that time is maybe to see his reaction, because in a way he's known to history as the person who betrayed his own family. Regicide is the worst mm -hmm. thing imaginable maybe but this is someone who has betrayed him to watch his reaction to this news and to see him writing that document that you described so vividly i think before. that's the extraordinary thing isn't it it's the fact that richard doesn't equate his own actions these extraordinary actions which even by the standards of the age even by the standards of the previous 30 years this these extraordinary 30 years of instability people are people are very used to very extreme things happening and even by those standards people are shocked at what richard does but he doesn't equate that at all with what Buckingham has now done to him. So really what these three scenes, if we bring them together, what they become in a way is a personality sketch of Richard. Because we see him as the powerful Lord willing to take the chance, you know, at the end of April. We see him as the ruthless protector who's willing to do anything. But then we also see perhaps like a bit of myopia from him, someone who doesn't see where his actions are leading him. And of course, this this isn't just Buckingham who, who revolts. There's all sorts of different rebellions in different parts of the country. Absolutely. You talk about Kent, and then in the south, there's, there's many more localised uprisings. And Richard has to, you know, he has to use all of his energy and, you know, quite clever organisation to put these down. Absolutely. In a way, it's the law of unintended consequences. As I said earlier, we don't really know what was in Richard's mind on that night of the 29th and 30th of April. Did he already have the idea that he might want to seize the throne? Maybe it wasn't even obvious to him. But there is this sense of slippage. But I think one of the things that we need to take away from this is that Richard was a king. He was a man who thought in black and white. He was very idealistic. One of his reactions from a young age to this extraordinary situation that he finds himself in, this extraordinarily unstable situation, is to reach for ideas, for order. He craves order. He craves clarity. And he finds this in books. He finds it in his own role under Edward IV, when he, he heads up the constable's court, the treason court, and he hands down sentences with absolute implacability. As a, as a subject of Edward IV, that serves him very well, that kind of loyalty. But as king, it serves him badly, because all this idealism he has as king, as I say earlier, he sees his power because he thinks he's the right man for the job. He thinks he can be the right king because he knows how to do it. But his ideals disintegrate on contact with reality. He has very little sense of real politic. He has very little sense of flexibility, of give and take, of understanding how people tick. Mm. And this ultimately is one of the reasons why Richard's reign disintegrates so rapidly. And the last thing I'll say about this scene before we leave it, because we can imagine him there in Lincoln, maybe confounded by the, the situation as it's developing. But there's just this tantalising detail that we have to touch on because at the same time there's Henry Tudor sailing towards I mean this isn't a successful invasion from his point of view but it's the sense of a small story which is going to become a bigger story this is going to be the foundation of the greatest dynasty in English history the Tudors 
They're just there, just on the side of the stage at this point. He manages to fend them off for now, but they're going to be back. And they're going to be back in a couple of years. They're going to be back. Perhaps I can conclude with this. Henry Tudor sails to join this rebellion, which is already failing in the autumn of 1483. He runs into a storm. His ships turn back. Only two ships make it. One of it is his, to the Dorset coast. They have to turn back as well. But he goes back to Brittany, where he's been in exile for 12 years, and he thinks he's failed. He's blown his chance. And the rebellion's failed as well. But the point about the rebellion failing is that all these Yorkist exiles, who are loyal to the memory of the princes, then they think it's the memory of the princes, because by common report, as you said earlier, people believe the prince is now to be dead. They flee to Brittany. And for them now, this extraordinary situation occurs because a Lancastrian fugitive, a man who has very little claim to the throne, who has a vanishingly small amount of royal blood, who people never ever think of as a king, suddenly becomes the only game in town for a bunch of Yorkist exiles. And of course, that leads us to Bosworth in two years' time, in which these Yorkist exiles, headed up by Henry Tudor, beat Richard III, kill Richard III, in brutal circumstances on the battlefield, and they hope to turn the clock back to the reign of Edward IV. But of course, Henry Tudor has other ideas. We'll leave you suspending your history and your story just there. Just some last thoughts from me. I mean, I was thinking as I was reading through this book, which really is, I'll emphasise this, it's a wonderful work of scholarship, but full of lucid writing. And I was thinking, how do I characterise your writing? How do I characterise this work? And I was thinking, you know, like in the Middle Ages, we have birds of prey being really potent symbols, falcons, hawks, hen harriers. And this is kind of what I was thinking about when I was reading your work. We can instantly conjure up the vision of a local lord out hunting rabbits with his falcon. And as I, as I was reading through the Brothers York, I thought, you know, this is what it's like. It's, you know, you're high up, you're, you're looking, wheeling in the sky over these events, but then just occasionally you'll sweep down onto a scene and give us something very dramatic, very quick, very close up. It's history on a grand scale, but it's also history up close, full of dramatic tension. It's a wonderful book. Um, many congratulations on it. But I want to ask you a final question before we conclude this episode of Travels Through Time. If you could bring one memento back to have in your writing room in London from the year 1483, is there anything you'd like to choose? I think there is, and I think it's, it's a piece of material culture that would nicely clarify for us exactly what Edward IV's intentions were for Richard. And it might help to address that moment right at the beginning of Richard's seizure of power. And that is Edward IV's will in oh, which okay. he was supposed to have laid out his plans for the government of his young son and his young brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester's place in that government. Well, it's a tantalising thought to think what might be contained in that. We'll give it to you now. OK, thank you very thank much, you very Tom, much. and it's been a pleasure. Peter, thank you for having me. It's a tantalising thought indeed. What alternative history of England might have been written into that document? I'm going to leave you with that thought to ponder. I'm Peter Moore, and this was Travels Through Time, and thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Paul Lay, editor of History Today, the world's leading serious history magazine. You can read more articles about Richard III and the Wars of the Roses on our website, www.historytoday.com forward slash travels through time. There you can read Tim Stanley on forgiving Richard III, Stephen Cooper on how Richard was viewed by his contemporaries, and Anne Bailey on how Richard has become a modern version of a medieval saint. Every month, History Today magazine features a wide range of articles on every aspect of the past written by leading historians. To subscribe, go to www.historytoday.com and dwell on the past. Hello, I'm Artemis, and that was Thomas Penn adding Edward IV's will to our list of mementos. It goes into the back of our time machine, alongside a copy of Isaac Newton's lecture notes for 1684, Mark Smeaton's keyboard, a fragment of the True Cross, and one of James Watts's little green bags made especially for inhaling nitrous oxide. There's a story behind each of these objects, of course, and you can find out much more about them from the History Today website. The most important object we have to tell you about, though, is Thomas Penn's magical new book, The Brothers York, which is published by Penguin Press and is out now. We'll be back in a fortnight for a trip to 1862 with Dr Thomas Waters, 
a real-life professor of the dark arts. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>